My name's Jenny Donovan. I am the CEO of the Australian Education Research Organisation, or AERO. In thinking about how to introduce this event, I found myself tempted to confess to a patchy history of mathematics success as a student and a minor bout of maths anxiety as an adult, but I'm not going to. So let me report instead that once, for a brief shining term in Year 7, I was in the top five of my maths class <laughs> and that as an adult I was able to recognise the folly of the ministerial advisor who thought we should simply set ourselves an improvement target of ensuring all our students are above average. <laughs> but, spoiler alert, as a nation we're not in a great place. And, as ever, the story is more dismal for more disadvantaged students. I truly hope that we can avoid a reprise of the reading wars in our efforts to improve the teaching of mathematics so that we'll deliver the improvement in the learning progress of our students. So let me introduce you to our stars. Eddie Wu is among Australia's most iconic educators. He teaches mathematics at Cherrybrook Technology High School, is leader of mathematics growth for the New South Wales Department of Education and is education ambassador at the University of Sydney. He's internationally recognised for his WooTube channel. He's author of Woo's Wonderful World of Maths and Eddie Woo's Magical Maths. Greg Ashman is Head of Mathematics and Head of Research at Ballarat Clarendon College in Victoria. In addition to teaching physics and maths, which he was doing up until 11.30am this morning before I had to jump on a plane to Sydney, he is a prolific blogger and podcaster on educational policy and practice and an enthusiastic and entertaining tweeter. He is a PhD candidate at the University of New South Wales where he gets to work with National Living Treasure Professor John Sweller who's with us this evening as well. Greg is also the author of The Truth About Teaching, An Evidence-Informed Guide for New Teachers and the power of explicit teaching and direct instruction. <coughs> We're going to begin by hearing from Eddie and then from Greg and then Glenn will moderate and offer the opportunity for some questions and answers. Gentlemen, thank you all and over to you, Eddie. Jenny, thank you. I know we're very short on time, but I can only comment and say, uh, as informative as you are witty, and we do miss you at the Department of Education. Tonight, with the very small time I have to open up today's discussion, and then I get the pleasure of handing over to Greg, I'd love to pose a very simple question to you. We're going to have a really broad ranging conversation tonight. So Glenn has promised, and I'm very nervous. However, I'd like to make sure that we have our laser focus on the core of our discussion today, which is not just mathematics, the subject, the discipline, the study, but what is the thing within mathematics and what is the kind of mathematics that matters? And we'll see how we go. I have a close eye on the clock and I think Glenn will grab me with a shepherd's crook if I go over, but I'll be ambitious and I'll see if we can even taste and experience some of that rather than just hear about it from me. So, my question to all of you, which normally I would throw to the floor if I had the luxury of time is, what do you think is the mathematics that matters? Mathematics is as diverse a subject as music or history or English, full of genres and areas of study. And yet I think that most of us often identify a particular branch of mathematics that we think is the mathematics that matters. I certainly remember when here in New South Wales, we were implementing new stage six syllabuses and in during the consultation period, it seemed like we were doomed to see another syllabus created by a committee that really had no singular vision around it because everything was someone's baby. <laughs> Every part of mathematics mattered to someone, and so it was exceedingly difficult to answer this question for a broad education system. Now, to prompt and provoke your thinking about this, what I'd like to suggest to you is actually not a musical or historical or a literary illustration, but, well, I have young children, this is about dinner time for me, so I would like to go in the direction of a culinary illustration. I don't know how many of you, in fact, I'm gonna ask the question because you can just raise your hand. How many of you enjoy cooking? Hands up. And how many of you enjoy eating cooking? Uh, yep, thank you, okay, that was, you passed the first test, you're awake enough to answer that question. 
When I think about cooking, uh, I notice the fact that I am not a skilled cook. Uh, I can blame the fact that my agricultural high school, which I very much enjoyed, did not in, you know, offer food technology or hospitality. It's just an excuse, but one of the things which I've since learned at a school which does really put into uh, its culinary and hospitality programs is when it comes to learning how to cook, there are two distinct areas that really need to be looked after. The first one is, I guess, what we would call the cuisines. And of course, we know what cuisines are, especially in a city like this or a country like this. You can think about Italian cuisine. Probably Japanese is my favorite. Uh, Indian, or if you really want to be very high cultured, you could go for Australian cuisine. Really, whatever floats your boat. Now, if you want to be a chef, you need to master cuisines, but that's not enough. Because to be a skilled chef, there is a series of core skills that no matter which cuisine you are cooking, you must master. For example, how to wield a knife, how to control heat in a pan, how to Make sure that you are balancing the right flavors and adjusting as you go. And then, of course, because we all eat with our eyes, how to plate up and present. And I guess we could say from cuisines to skills, these are two inseparable things that a chef must learn. What does this have anything to do with mathematics? I wonder if you can see the metaphor and the line I'm trying to draw. Though we don't call them cuisines, they may as well be by a different name. In mathematics, we have all of these different content or topic areas. Perhaps you want to go for geometry or networks or algebra or data and statistics. These are often what we think of as the different areas of mathematics, the content. But at the same time, at least say, for example, here in New South Wales, we would say no matter which topics you are looking at, there is a set of core skills. The New South Wales syllabus calls them working mathematically. Within Akara's curriculum, we would call them the proficiency strands. Fluency, understanding, problem solving, reasoning, justification, and communicating. Now, for me, these are at the core, but importantly, these are not two things to separate. Often in our dialogue around education, and particularly mathematics, there's a push to separate these things. Do we have a curriculum that focuses on knowledge, or is it one that focuses on skills? Regardless of which century they seem to belong to, they often get labeled 21st, despite being, I think, arguably useful long time before we hit this century. For me, I think about the words of E.D. Hirsch, who said, content is skill, and skill is content. These are two things that are united, and I personally resist the false dichotomy that's made between them, even though they're distinct. Now, as I said, I was going to be bold and ambitious, and I wanted to do more than just sort of introduce this idea to you. I wonder if you could think about with me why this really matters. What is it that's specific and unique about mathematics that sets it apart? Well, I love science. One of the things about it is that its form of knowledge, its epistemological basis, is repeated observation and experimentation. We can do a lot with science, but it's important to recognize that this does not cut it in the mathematics classroom. You can give me millions of triangles, all of whose angles add up to 180 degrees, and that still does not constitute anything like what we would call proof. Nonetheless, science is powerful, but you can't use it for everything, can you? When we think about history, I loved history as a as a child, it was actually the subject that I spent most time on, mostly because of all the reading. But you cannot repeat history and observe it. So we use sources, we weave a narrative thread that makes sense of all of the things together, and we say, well, does this, on analysis, actually give us a satisfying explanation for what happened? And this is what constitutes historical proof. But unlike any of these, mathematics alone uses just one power, deductive reasoning. There is something wonderfully democratic about mathematics that it doesn't require any pedigree or equipment. It takes a mind, a human mind, and that's it. Now, as I mentioned before, this role of reasoning isn't just something within New South Wales or Australia. If you go over to the US or the UK, you can see it right there. Adaptive reasoning, down here from off call reason, make deductions and inferences to draw conclusions. For me, this is the mathematics that matters, and the way that we get there is going to depend on the context, our students, and what our 
time what our culture is going to require of it, particularly, for example, in a global pandemic where we're being introduced to logarithmic scales and R numbers and a whole different suite of things which most of us here in the room, eyeballing our average age, didn't really encounter, even if we did very advanced mathematics at school. So, I wonder if you would indulge me in the three minutes I have left to play a brief game to see if you can hold on to this with me, not just hear about it, but actually, to take my culinary metaphor, taste. I'd like you to turn to the person closest to you. You're gonna to need to be paired up to play this brief little game. And between the two of you, I'm gonna ask you to do something which normally is considered bad etiquette at an event, which is to get out your phone. Now, between the two of you who are seated next to each other, and if you have a friend or if you're about to introduce yourself to a stranger, I'd love one of you who can get their phone out to uh, just open up to where you can write a text. Uh, it, you don't need to write a text to anyone, though if you hit send on what we're about to do, they may end up very confused. <laughs> now, what I'd like you to do between the two of you is, you're going to help me come up with some numbers, okay? Here's the way it's going to work. Choose between the two of you who will be the first player, and I'd like that person to choose a number between one and four, and then just write it on your phone. One, two, three, or four. Go ahead and write it anywhere on your phone. Once you've done that, it isn't secret, so you can actually show the person you're playing with. Now, player one by now has chosen a number. Player two, could I ask you to raise your hand once you know what your opponent's number is? Okay, I, I'll know you're ready when half the room has their hands up. Okay, fabulous, thank you. If you just raise your hand, you're player two, and you're gonna do something very similar to player one. You're also gonna choose a number between one and four, but you're going to add that number on to whatever number your friend, new friend, just told you. So for instance, if player one had chosen the number two, and you have chosen the number three, what I'd like you to now write down, just so you don't have to keep it in your memory, is two plus three, which is Five. Can you go ahead, player two, and write your new number? You can choose whatever you like, as long as it's between one and four. One, two, three, four. Okay. Now, this is the way the game is going to go back and forth. But you only need to know one more rule to play this game and complete it, which is the rule that tells you how to win this game. Because I did tell you you were opponents, and one of you is about to win this game. Here's the way it works. The astute among you will have noticed this game is a name. It is called the game of 23. One of you eventually is going to be the one who can write down the number, type the number 23. That person, after a certain number of terms, they will be crowned the winner. We only have enough time for one game, which upsets me because we could learn a lot more if we played a few, but will you please indulge me for the next 60 seconds, go back and forth until someone hits 23. And then wave your hand at me when someone wins, please. I presume by now there are winners and there are losers. I won't make you self-identify, it's fine. Here's what I'd like you to do with me. Have a look at your phone where you played that game and look at the numbers that you both typed. I have an important question to ask of you that requires you to see those numbers. Here's the question. Would you please raise your hand if at any point during the game, your opponent, the person you're playing against, raise your hand if they ever typed the number 18. Did this happen to anyone? Hands up, it should have been a few of you at least. Okay, a few hands, all right, thank you, hands down, right? Now, if this didn't happen to you, just play pretend with me, imagine that it did, okay? Now, if it did, I'm just gonna make a prediction about what happened between you when this took place in the game. Your friend uh, wrote down the number 18, they passed the phone to you, and then you looked for a moment, and then you paused. <laughs> and then you said, um, Greg, I know we've just met, I like you, but I don't wanna play this game anymore, <laughs> right? Because what you've realized is, having written down 18, your friend, well, they're not their friend, your friend anymore, are they? They've just won. Because there is nothing you can do, no number you can choose, that will stop them winning the game. Now, for me, <laughs> This is the mathematics that matters. Mathematics that helps me understand why is it that in fact, this was not at all the game of 23, was it? It was actually a game all along about 18, except 
if you're starting to realize now that I lied to you when I introduced the game, if the game of 23 is not really about 23, it's about 18, then perhaps the cogs are turning and you've realized a game of 18 is not about 18 either. In fact, it's about something much earlier, which I will leave as an exercise to the reader for you to discover. Thank you for playing with me. I hope you'll have a think about these ideas tonight as we further discuss. Thanks. Um, well, uh, thanks, thanks for that, Eddie. Um, oh, that's just me. That's who I am. That's my substack. Um, I want to show you this graph. So what I've done here is nothing, nothing very um, special. The top line, and this is uh, for, uh, so the AMSI, Australian Mathematical Sciences Institute, they do a survey every year where they talk about, um, they, assess, they measure essentially who's taking higher and uh, intermediate level maths courses at the um, year 12 level. Uh, in my state of uh, Victoria, the intermediate level is known as math methods and the higher level is known as specialist maths. And in New South Wales, there are similar uh, courses. And so they look at the proportion throughout Australia. And you can see that the proportion taking intermediate, uh, that top line there, that's declining. It's been declining. There's a bit of a dip, um, which is actually related to Queensland um, going to a test-based system from a coursework system, interestingly. Uh, the bottom line is the higher maths course. Uh, so that's, in my state, that's specialist maths. So this is the really technical stuff with differential equations and things like that. Uh, the, both courses have calculus in. Um, the specialist maths has a, a slightly more advanced level of calculus. And then in the middle, I've plotted uh, Australia's PISA results um, over the same period. And that's the scale at the right-hand side. Now, not all correlations are causation. I'm going to make a case that uh, that for something that's not actually popular, even though it's obvious, even though it's obvious, it's not popular idea. So this is what everybody thinks, right? That if you want to get students to do maths, you need to motivate them. Yes, you need to get them going. So uh, particularly uh, girls, because we're always concerned about girls and maths achievement. So what you need to do, you need to, get, you need to herd these 14-year-old, uh, 15-year-old girls into a room. You need to put a very inspirational maths teacher in front of them who's going to motivate them. And then they're going to go away, and then they're going to learn lots of maths because they're so motivated. And that's going to lead to their achievement in maths. This is what everybody thinks. However, this is probably not the case. The motivation you're going to get from that speaker or from that really cool activity or from whatever it is that you think is motivational is going to last a short period of time. If you want students to be motivated about maths, you want them to be motivated over an extended period of time. And the way that you do that is you give them a sense of achievement. Because when you're getting better at something, you feel good about yourself and you feel good about the something. Not a difficult idea to, to get your head around. And in fact, um, a couple of years ago, well, say a couple of years ago, I'm showing my age, probably about 2016, I think it was, uh, there was a study done in Canada and they tracked elementary school uh, uh, students in maths, and they measured their motivation for maths at time one, and their achievement at time one. And then later on, they measured their motivation for maths at time two, and their achievement at time two. They found that motivation did not predict later achievement. They found that achievement did predict later motivation. Now, that's, that's at one extreme. If you look at the consensus on this field, this sort of motivational field, and it's really complex because these motivational constructs, we call them, they're, they're all slightly different and they all measure slightly different things, self-efficacy, self-concept, uh, personal interest. It's quite, a, it's quite a, um, a swamp when you get into it all and try and figure it all out. But the overall consensus is that there's probably a two-way relationship. So motivation does, prob unlike in the ca Canadian study, it probably does affect late, later achievement, but achievement affects later motivation. So why, in that context, would we, when we see our declining performance on a robust external measure, I'm not a huge fan of PISA, but it's fairly robust, it's an external measure, we don't get to control it, 
We don't get to um, you know, fix the system so that we're always getting better uh, scores on it. It's out there. It's not under our control. So it's fairly robust. If that's declining, so kids at the age of 15, that's what PISA, PISA measures, uh, don't know as much more maths as they used to, then is it really surprising that fewer, fewer of them are choosing to do maths at higher and intermediate level when they're in year 11 and 12? But this is not the conversation people are having, ladies and gentlemen. They're not. They're not talking about that. They're not connecting achievement with students taking these courses. They're thinking it's about a whole load of other things because they're stuck on the idea that motivation has to precede achievement. And it leads to some funny effects. Um, 18 times 5. There's a uh, professor of maths education in the US called Jo Bowler. She actually hails from my part of the world. She supports West Bromwich Albion, which is very unfortunate. Um, but she, she wrote, I was reading a book that she wrote, Mathematical Mindsets, and she talks at great length about 18 by 5 and all the different ways you can solve 18 by 5. And she went to Silicon Valley because there's you know, lots of easily enthused people in Silicon Valley, it appears. So she went to Silicon Valley and she said, show me how you can solve 18 by 5. And they, said, they come up with all these different ways of multiplying 18 by 5. And they got so excited and enthused about it that they made T-shirts with 18 times 5 on the T-shirts. And the question arises, why? <laughs> but this isn't quite an important point. There's a lot of activity that happens in maths with no purpose. A few years ago at my place, we had this one teacher. They had this thing uh, called, um, what was it called? Greedy pig, I think it was called. And it involved a big dice. And you rolled the dice down the middle of the classroom. And because this one teacher did it, the other teachers wanted to do it too, because they didn't want their kids to miss out on doing the greedy pig with the, the dice. And I said, but what's it for? What maths are we trying to teach through this activity? And no one could clearly articulate what they were trying to do. And in a lot of maths, this is what happens. People have this vague sense that if we're doing something with numbers, we're doing maths. And that's just enough, because kids will just learn maths. Um, and so without having a clearly worked out idea of what we're trying to do. And I think that this is connected to this idea that we have around motivation as well. Um, another big issue we have in maths is everyone sees it functionally. Everyone says, well, when am I ever going to have to solve quadra quadratic equations at the supermarket? Why are you making me learn this stuff? What's the point? Well, you won't. But you probably don't even need to add up at the supermarket because you're just going to tap your card. You don't need to know much stuff. You can be profoundly ignorant in 21st century society and survive. Is that what you want? Why is it that maths is measured by this functional standard that we need to be able to do mundane things with it? We don't do that with other subjects. We don't hold them to that. So, well, sometimes people do that. So why have we got to learn Shakespeare? That's the same kind of stupidity. Um, OK. so. This activity-based uh, thing ca came, caused me to uh, come up with a few years ago, slightly tongue-in-cheek, and I decided to name it after myself, um, Ashman's first principle of educational psychology. Students tend to learn the things you teach them and don't tend to learn, tend to learn the things that you don't teach them. And, but this is the point. If we're just creating these activities and pushing kids through activities and not really thinking about what we're trying to achieve, what we want them to learn as a result of it, that's a big problem. Um, now, here we go. That all precedes what we, what we often think about as the debate. So uh, the Australian draft mathematics curriculum was published, I think it was April last year, something like that, and it really pushed a particular teaching style. Now, a curriculum document is not supposed to do that. A curriculum document is supposed to lay, lay out what it is we want students to know, okay? What we're trying to teach them. Instead, it had lots of sort of Kids should do this activity or do that activity. They should investigate. They should problem solve. So it really pushed a particular type of teaching that you might call inquiry learning. You might call problem-based learning. You might call constructivist teaching. There's all sorts of names for it. Because basically, it doesn't work very well. So as soon as people figure that out, um, you, you change the name to something else. <laughs> and then you have a go at that for a while. That doesn't work very well. So you change the name to something else. So it's got lots of names, this teaching style. But in a sense, that, like what I've said about motivation and actually thinking about what you want the students to achieve, that's 
more foundational than these discussions about teaching style, which sort of sit on top of that. Um, this uh, is a very good book. Um, it's quite expensive. So, but it's uh, constructivist. It, it basically, as far as I'm concerned, it finishes that debate. Uh, if you read this book, one of the editors who started uh, with an open mind read all the arguments for and against, in this term, constructivist instruction. Uh, but as I said, it's got many names. And uh, came up with the view that what you want to do is you want to not do that. You want to teach the things that you want the students to learn explicitly. You want to break it down into small pieces put those pieces back together, synthesize them. And eventually, if you want people to be able to do complex problem solving, that's probably the most effective way to get there. So again, this hints to what we need to do. We've got, at the moment in Australia, I, I would sense a lot of activity, a lot of people doing maths, a lot of people trying to motivate people about doing maths. Probably not the level, as Zig Engelman, the famous advocate of direct instruction in the US would say, not enough at the level of picky, picky, picky detail, figuring out this is what we want to learn. These are the small steps that we have to take to get students to that point. I think I'm done. Have I got any other slides? Oh, oh yeah. That, that's just from the original draft of the Australian curriculum, which I thought was quite psychedelic. I quite like it. <laughs> I'm done. There you go. Eddie, you've, um, you've given us a pretty inspiring introduction to your world of maths and and those that have followed you over the years probably are familiar that you've had a bit of a journey to become as passionate about maths as you are today but you're an anomaly in australia we have an overwhelmingly negative attitude toward mathematics why is that and how have we gotten this way I think it's not too difficult to think about why, in fact, I'm anomalous in that I, I think most people who, if I, you know, you go to a party, uh, Greg, I'm sure you have this experience where you catch a taxi and it's like, oh, what do you do? I'm, I'm a metals trader. A met okay, <laughs> sure. Well, then I can have a meaningful conversation <laughs> with you. If you were truthful about what you did, I'm sorry, either I have no interest in carrying on this conversation, a maths teacher, good Lord, or I'm going to take all the trauma that I have stored up over the last <laughs> two decades and lay them at your feet. Thank you, Mr. Ashman. Uh, I think, in fact, of uh, a time when I was working in regional New South Wales and was doing an event uh, not dissimilar to this. Uh, anyone could come along, talked about mathematics and why it matters. And uh, a lady came up at the end um, who was, I'm going to guess, at about 80 or 85 years old. And she said to me, Eddie, I wish mathematics education had some of the character of what you speak about now when I had been going through because the way that I learned mathematics was that the teacher would put a problem up on the board, would instruct us all to write the answer to said problem on our hands and we would be instructed to raise our hands when our answer was ready and when we all had our hands up, my teacher would go to the front of the classroom, she would open up the drawer in her front desk and she would take out her cane. And no student who had the wrong answer written on their hand ever forgot it ever again, as obviously this woman hadn't 75 years later. Uh, there is a traumatic experience that so many students endure. Um, learning mathematics, it's hardly a surprise that there is this widespread negative attitude. And I go back to Greg's comment, which I completely agree with, about achievement being the motivator. If we feel disempowered and disenfranchised, disenfranchised in a subject, then it is hardly any surprise mm. that we are demotivated by it. Well, Greg, don't we just need to make it a bit more fun, a bit more enjoyable? If we just played enough games, <laughs> if we made maths, if we just no, made maths all about games, wouldn't that just solve the problem? You, you, we shouldn't try and make maths deliberately dull. I, I'm not arguing for that. I mean, if you can, if you can make a connection that will interest students, and it is relevant to what... The, but the point is, you, you've got to know what you're trying to teach. You've got to know what it is you want the students to learn as a result of that class. And if your motivating thing or your little hook or your game doesn't serve that purpose, it's, 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 not, it's not going to deliver on that outcome. So it's not about deliberately making it um, dull. I mean, in, in a sense, what Eddie's described... Without, I, I don't go around whacking kids on the hands with a cane, but in my class, kids would answer on a mini whiteboard and they'd hold up their answers on the mini whiteboard. And we use um, as our playbook something called Rosenshine's Principles of Instruction, uh, which uh, is derived from lots of research in the 60s where 
uh, researchers went into teachers' classrooms and sort of observed their behaviours and then tried to correlate behaviours to get learning gains of students and distilled out what they thought the most effective behaviours were. So it's correlational research. It's not like proper experimental stuff, but it's really quite useful for practitioners. And they came up with a figure of something like an 80% success rate. So when I'm looking at these mini whiteboards that kids are holding up, I'm looking to see if something like 80% of them have, have nailed it. Because if I am, if, if that's what I'm seeing, they're, they're probably getting a sense of success, um, particularly if it's different kids each time, they're getting a sense of success, they're getting a sense of achievement, and they'll probably be able to, um, to continue with that. Whereas if it's, if it's less, if it's you know 20%, I know I'm pitching it at completely the wrong level. But so I think the, the achievement side is important. We don't necessarily want to deliberately make things boring, but when we do make things interesting, it's got to be in the service of a very clear idea about what the maths is that we want the students to learn. Well, I suppose one of the ways that we do that is to try to draw an application to real world or as applied circumstances as possible as an inroad to making something, I suppose, more tangible. Eddie, how do you balance keeping the boring stuff but also applying it to a, a situation or an application that is engaging. Is this a juggle? Yeah, I don't know if I accept the premise of the question, Glenn, <laughs> mainly because you referred to some of mathematics as the boring stuff. Did you catch that? <laughs> the audacity. Um, I mean, I, I would, I mean, you know, tongue and cheek aside, I would say actually everything that is in the mathematics syllabuses uh, around the country, and I'm, I feel very thankful that I've been able to encounter a few different jurisdictions around the world, um, that's been labored over. It's true that anything can be taught in a boring way, anything. Actually, I know someone who once said mathematics is the easiest subject to teach badly. Um, but I think that in terms of you know, real world application, uh, it goes a little bit, uh, Greg sort of referred to this point about this false functional expectation being applied. I mean, I imagine, I, I enjoyed English a lot at school. Um, I loved studying literature, I even more enjoyed writing it. And can we imagine if we took the large numbers of boys, for example, who are disengaging with English at higher levels and said, well, we need to, we need to make this more engaging and more relevant, real world, I know what we'll do. We'll hand them a 400 page manual about real world economics and I'll ask them to study that and analyze that text. It's like, well, you know what? Maybe that will not be the way that will actually engage them. Maybe relevance is not exactly the right proxy that we're looking for. And you know, when we're having a look at that, I mean, Greg pointed out exactly, I asked you all to play a game with me. And I had in my mind, had I more than 15 minutes, exactly where I would have taken that lesson mm. next. It's my, it's my favorite introduction, actually, apart from a deck of playing cards, um, to stage four algebra. It's just a wonderful, because you know, it's a game between one and four and 23, but what if it's not one and four? What if it's not 23? It's very wonderful for actually experiencing what we call generalization. Mm. But in the absence of knowing where that's going, I think, like Greg mentions, there is this allure toward engagement in any form that's attractive, regardless of whether it actually helps anyone learn anything or not. So for me, that's how I hold that tension. I do not think, I don't, I don't buy that something has to be real world to be deeply engaging or actually help with concrete and explicit learning. Greg, we're talking in this space around, effectively what we're talking around is concepts and procedures, and we're talking around knowledge and skills. The 21st century is a skills era, isn't it? Hmm. I, I, can I just say in a sec, I just want to say something on relevance. The problem with trying to make everything real world is that the real world is quite a messy place. And there's a guy in the US, uh, Dan Meyer, uh, and he, he did a TED talk back in 2011 or something, and he talked about the textbooks for maths contain too much help. Uh, and what we need to be is less helpful. And we need to take all the structure out of the textbooks and make them all real world. And he had this idea of filling up a water tank, taking all the structure away from that and getting the kids to figure it out. What you've done is you've made the problem far more complex. The kids don't know which elements to pay attention to. They don't know which is important which is relevant, which is not. And you've made it a much more challenging problem. Now, we tend to think that that will be more motivating for them. But it's actually quite confusing and frustrating. Um, John's here. John, is, um, John Sweller is the father of cognitive load theory. And that's based on the idea that there are only so many things, probably about four things, that we can pay attention to at any one time. So if you, if you overwhelm a novice 
with a complex real-world problem. You're not going to get a motivated novice. You're going to get a frustrated novice. So the, some of the simplification we do and the abstraction and, and the unreality of what we do in maths is to actually make it more achievable and to give students the ability to comprehend the maths and learn the, the principles and move forward. Uh, in terms of the 21st century, look, I don't know what people mean by that, really. As AD made the really good point that the things that people talk about as 21st century skills, problem solving, uh, creativity, um, they've always been important. And they've always been around. Like People have always been solving problems and being creative without um, a radical shift in the education system to deliver that. Um, and they're also, as I think Eddie alluded to, they are specific to particular domains. Um, just because you can solve algebra problems doesn't mean that you're going to be an expert at solving the, the problem of, of this uh, deteriorating marriage. You know, they're, they're different things. Like, but people talk about problem solving as, as if it's a skill that you can just learn. I can learn how to problem solve, and I can apply it here, there, and everywhere. Even in within a subject like maths, you know, solving an algebra problem is you need quite a different set of tools to solving, um, you know, a, a sort of a, a geometry problem. So even then, it, the problem solving doesn't transfer from one thing to the other. Transfer the ability to teach someone X, and then then be able to use that in a different situation with a different type of problem is elusive. It's the unicorn of education, it's really difficult to achieve. And this was figured out um, over a century ago, yet we still pretend as if it's perfectly possible that we can teach general skills like critical thinking, and you can think critically about this, and then you can just apply that over there. In order to think critically about something, you need a huge amount of knowledge about that something. And to be creative, you need, you know, I, I, you, you can't write a sonata on a piano unless you can play the piano. Um, you, you, no amount of creativity will get you there. Sorry. I don't know whether I addressed your question. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, you, what you're getting to is that we need knowledge to do these so-called 21st century skills. But, Eddie, these are typically framed as being a kind of more ambitious goal in education, to cultivate critical thinkers, effective problem solvers, that sort of thing. Is there any merit to us focusing directly on problem solving if we want to get better problem solvers? Is there any merit? Is there any merit? Is a low bar to get over? which I will happily answer yes, <laughs> there is. I no mean, short I, answers allowed. <laughs> sure, fine. Okay, I mean, where I would say there is, there is genuine value and there is an attempt to be, to, to restore balance or to hold, maintain attention is that, you know, I've, I've certainly sat in and taught in classrooms where there is an overemphasis at, on procedural knowledge to the exclusion of anything else which is... Uh, attendant to that or flowing from that. Now, the procedures have to be there as a bedrock. Uh, I think, I, you know I, know, I know that example of 18 times five, and if I do not have an efficient algorithm for working out what that is, then it does not matter very much if I have nine ways to solve it. However, I value nine ways to solve it if those yield insight, or in fact, I was reading um, Paul Lockhart's uh, book, Measurement. Some of the people in the room might be familiar with Paul Lockhart's um, A Mathematician's Lament, which is all about the, the, he decries the problems in what mathematics education has looked like for, for decades, and then presents an alternative view of what that looks like in, in his book, Measurement. And one of the things which stands out is there's this beauty in mathematics, and I'm just going to go out on a limb and say several of the people in this room are here because they believe in that beauty that can be seen better from nine different angles. It's why if one has a diamond, they do not remain content looking at it from one angle, but we, we twist and we turn and we look at it in different lights and that helps us appreciate the thing better. However, doing all of that does not necessarily make me a better or more skilled jeweler or able to identify what is a, a genuine diamond and what is not. So there has to be, for me, this focus on, say, for example, critical and creative thinking, it needs to maintain unity with all this domain knowledge that has to come along for the ride. I love that we can have a look at differential equations with our students because they relate to things that really matter in our world. But I need to build for that. If there's one thing that I've learned from the videos of mine that have become popular, which I never predicted, just the algorithm does what it does, and, and children and adults look at these and it's a mystery to me, 
Except it's not that much of a mystery because it's the things that are clear, that make sense of the different pieces of, what was the, um, the quote that you just ended with? Those, that fine picky detail. Picky, picky detail. That picky, picky detail. Yeah. That is what the teaching of mine that's resonating with people actually focuses on. So I think that it is, it is silly to try and divorce these things and we end up in all kinds of problems when we do. So what are the, what are, Greg, what are the difficulties? In, what, are, well, I suppose, what are the picky details that really matter when it comes to teaching in maths? What, make, what makes good teaching attentive to the picky details? Um, ooh, that's what we've been working on at my place for several years. Um, it's hard. Uh, everyone wants to talk in big broad brush terms, but I just want to talk just a little to that broad brush. Um, in the late 60s, uh, President Lyndon Johnson was looking to, they had this, I think it was called Head Start, um, which was like a inv big investment in early years education. And they wanted to move it through into, um, well, it must have been uh, later years, let's say. And Congress wouldn't let him have all the money that he wanted. So in the end, they cut all the money back and they created an experiment instead. So they used the money to have this big experiment. It's the biggest experiment ever been done in education. It's it was messy, um, not, not perfectly designed experiment, but it was a big experiment. And basically, different uh, researchers could propose different ways to, to teach young kids, essentially. And you had models that were called cognitive, where they were trying to get kids to become really good problem solvers. You had models that explicitly tried to address students' self-esteem, because one of the theories was that they didn't make progress because they lacked self-esteem. You had a set of models called basic skills models, which focused on basic skills, as the name suggests. Um, and um, one of those was Zig Engelman, the guy with the quote. It was uh, his direct instruction model. Now, the direct instruction model, which focused on basic skills, uh, was focused on teaching kids to read, teaching them to do uh, basic mathematics and things like that. And at the end, they did a battery of assessments. They did all sorts of assessments. They did um, reading comprehension assessments and, and things like that. Now, many of the self-esteem models actually had a negative impact on student self-esteem. The only model that had a positive impact on problem-solving skills, I might have this wrong, there might have been another basic skills model that did, but I think it was direct instruction was the only one that had a positive impact on problem-solving skills. So there's no conflict between teaching these the basic skills, as, which sounds mundane and not very, who wants to go to a, a conference in uh, Melbourne or Sydney and, and eat prawn sandwiches and, and learn about basic skills? No one wants to do that, do they? They want to learn about creativity and, and critical thinking. But it, there's no conflict between giving kids these basic skills to do these nuts and bolts things and them developing these capacities that we want to be able to solve problems and think critically. Um, so I forgot what the actual question was. <laughs> Picky details. Picky details. <laughs> so what we do, and this is, this is really, it's very basic. We all teach the same uh, curriculum. We all teach the same lesson plans. So as a team, we plan all our lessons down to the lesson plans. We start with principles like the Rosenstein's principle of instruction. We look at things from a cognitive load theory perspective, so we try and make sure that our slides aren't busy with lots of too much stuff. So, and then what we run our, um, our classes, and say there's three people teaching you seven at the end of a unit, do an assessment. We sit down and we go, well, on question 3B, uh, Glenn's class uh, got 80%. Whereas my class and Eddie's class got 55%, 60%. But we've all taught the same curriculum. And so, Glenn, show us how you would do this problem if you're going to do it. So Glenn stands up and starts working through the problem on the board. And it turns out that he's done something that isn't documented in the curriculum that he's just thought of to do at the moment. He's probably added an extra step, like one extra step. There's a, there's a one of my teachers, uh, Katie, she, I actually taught her. She uh, used to go to our school. I taught her physics. Now she's in my team teaching maths. And um, there's this thing with transformations of functions where um, I don't want to go into too much detail here with the maths, but basically the sign that goes after the x term is deceptive. So if you've got x minus 2, it's gone in the positive direction. If you've got x plus 2, it's gone in the negative direction. So it's deceptive. The sign after the, the x is, is deceptive. And she just came up with this little phrase, don't trust your x. <laughs> And so that's what I say, and that's what we all say now. And it says it in the curriculum, and we all do it. 
And it, and it, sound, and it's, as much, it sounds, it's those small things, but when you've got a lot of them and you add them all together, you get a big thing. On the, on the theme of early, early difficulties flowing through to down, downstream, Greg, and I know we're whizzing through from early foundations to later, but you've pointed out to us the, the clear decline, if stagnation and decline, depending on whether we're talking advanced or intermediate math participation later in school, obviously with downstream effects upon post-school choices and so on. What's driving, what's driving that? Is it just that, what comes first, I suppose? Is it underachievement in PISA that drives lack of participation in advanced maths later on? Or is there something else happening that's doing both of those things before it all? And should we just make advanced maths mandatory for everyone and problem solved? Uh, no, look, obviously PISA, no one, like kids don't know how they've gone in PISA. PISA is just an indicator uh, of something else that's going on. We're obviously not teaching maths well enough. Um, now, some people hypothesize that that's because, in fact, AMSI is big on the idea that it's people teaching outside of their area. So people that are not qualified maths teachers teaching maths, that could be part of it. Uh, I think the, the tyranny of bad ideas is part of it as well. There's a lot of activity, with, with, as I've said already, that isn't directed necessarily towards anything in particular. There are views about teaching maths through inquiry uh, and discovery. If you look at things like uh, maths facts, so just going, going back a little bit to not quite the, what we're talking about in kindergarten, but when we're getting into primary school, kids need to know their number bonds, you know, that eight and to make 10 and just automatically, they don't want to be working that out. And similarly with multiplication facts, they need to know uh, 7, 8, 56. They don't need to, want, you don't want to be working that out because again, we've got a very limited ability to, we can only think about four things at once. So if one of those things is working out how to multiply uh, seven by eight, then how are you going to do the complex problem solving that you're trying to do that that's a part of? You can't. So, um, and the, the, when the when the draft uh, uh, curriculum came out they, uh, last year, they, they actually pushed that back and they softened the language. So it could be interpreted that kids didn't actually have to master those as facts, but that they could sort of work them out. So there's there's a lot of bad ideas, and that's all feeding in um, to this decline. But I, I, the only thing that we know is there's a decline, and everyone's got their ideas about what that is. I'm, I'm probably focused on teaching methods. That's one of the things that, I, that exercises me. But these other things about people teaching out of field and stuff like that, that's probably going to be part of it as well. Well, Eddie, you're, you're doing some work with the department on this issue. Um, how, do we, how do we fill more maths classrooms with teachers who are confident, ready and able mm. to teach maths? Yeah. Uh, I mean, Greg is right. Uh, one of the big challenges is that we, not every kid, gets to have Greg in front of them. And that is a huge, well, well, I mean, people can sort of get me on their phone, but anyway, um, <laughs> I, not that I'm encouraging any students who are watching this recording to go and look in their phones and anyway. Um, so what you're alluding to is um, some of the work that I get to do with the Department of Education, which I'm, I feel very privileged to be able to do this and also be able to teach at my school at the same time because, um, you know, education bureaucracies around the world are very good at promoting excellent educators outside of the classroom. Um, and for me, what I'm really passionate about is marrying. Uh, we have this fantastic, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, we have this fantastic curriculum expertise workforce within the department who are dedicated to supporting schools. It's very similar to um, the Singapore master teacher model. But what we lack structurally is the other part of the Singaporean structure model, which is there are people who are focused on implementation of that in the classroom and aren't removed from classrooms. And those, for me, are two wings of one plane. And when you take away um, that expertise from what it looks like in the classroom and how it's enacted and provide the actual sustained support, support to implement that, um, or if you just try and provide a whole bunch of localized people who really are great at relationship but they don't have access to that deep knowledge and expertise, well, your plane is in trouble. So uh, my team is called the Mathematics Growth Team and it is all about instructional leadership based in schools. And for me, I feel excited about and, and know the impact of talking about evidence and evaluation. When teachers are given the time and support to develop their own pedagogy, 
there isn't a limit to what they can achieve. In fact, time poverty, every teacher in the room knows that is the key limiting factor. Teachers are not lacking for desire or motivation to teach better lessons. They are just not given it's, it's a very bricks without straw type situation. So for me, um, being able to provide those kinds of instructional leaders to support people in schools is what I'm passionate about and what my work is, is focused on. Greg, isn't part of this problem as well that we can say one solution might be give more training to math teachers. No, don't do that. <laughs> and CIS research would suggest that many people coming through university degrees in mathematics are not get not getting given quite all the tools that they're going to need to be effective. Certainly very little of what you've heard tonight would feature in a, an initial teacher education program, unfortunately. Don't we need more mathematics education experts to, no, to explain no, this? No, we don't. Um, look, ed, teaching is, is structured uh, badly. Uh, most one of the, you could argue people talk about teaching as a profession and one of the arguments that it's not a profession is that teachers are not in charge of it teachers are told what to do by other people that, that's how it's set up uh, people generally speaking who are non-teachers uh, some people some who have never taught uh, some who uh, have taught uh, briefly and gone into academia and these are the people that train new teachers um and it's not practicing teachers. That, this, this gets to Eddie's point, really. Practicing teachers of the way we've structured things are basically just too busy to do any of that. Um, and so it, it's, it's plagued by being told what to do by other people. And the other people have their own agendas. So, it, you know, university education faculties, it, you get points with your colleagues not by training teachers who are really effective maths teachers, but by, you know, writing papers on Foucault and Derrida and, you know what I mean? And it's, it's all useless. Um, but this is who we've put in charge of training people. And then it's up at the universities. They don't teach them about explicit teaching. They don't teach primary teachers about phonics. They're not interested. So if you give more time in universities, that's the opposite of the solution. And like maths education experts are not usually experts in maths education. They're, they're, they're more interested in, um, you know, various other important stuff. Like, but, you know, they'd be more interested in particular social justice issues or, or they'd argue a way... Um, they did say well, it's impossible, it's intractable. You can't, you can't improve maths instruction in schools until you fix poverty first. You know, that's the, and, and, and it's not, so, and that comes from the fact that it's not a practitioner-led profession. And so, and so we sort of get done to us. And like this panel today, like you've got two teachers on a panel, that's rare. Like most people, most panels talking about education will have a professor and, um, you know, someone else. And, and it's not that professors have nothing to add to education. The cognitive, cognitive science educational psychology has loads to tell teachers, but, they, but those things are not being taught in initial teacher education because they don't fit the narrative. So it's all wrong. Um, and we need to disrupt that somehow, I think, um, in many different ways and have lots of different models that people can try out and see if we can break the kind of stranglehold that that is on initial teacher education at the moment. So we've covered a, a wide range of territory here from curriculum to pedagogies, teacher education, early childhood, senior secondary. We've deliberately touched on a wide range of areas are the areas that I think that give us a taste of what really matters in this area. But we have a little bit of time available for questions to hear from you. So if you raise your hand, we'll, we'll aim to get to as many as possible in the next 10 minutes. Uh, good evening. My name is Rory Robertson. I'm an economist. Um, I've got a question for the panel and for the, the group uh, in general. Um, just, I'll start with some numbers and then the question. So uh, I think it's true that in, in year 12, uh, it's about 50-50 boy-girl split. In year 12 uh, maths, uh, advanced maths, I think it's about a two-to-one boy-girl split. Um, in, in year 12 economics, it's about a two-to-one boy-girl split. In university, in university graduates, I think it's something like, you know, four-to-one uh, more male STEM grads than females. Um, in university grads, something like four times as many uh, female um, gender studies grads as male grads. 
Um, in society, we're talking about the gender pay gap and it implicitly assumes basically uh, that everyone's got the same jobs, the job splits about even Stephen. So my question is, does it make sense for society to talk about gender pay gaps without focusing on the need for boys and girls uh, to study maths, chemistry, physics, economics in, in broadly even numbers rather than this, uh, you know, dramatically, uh, there's a dramatic um, shortage of skills in STEM starting with maths, physics and chemistry at school. Is, is that, does that make sense? Yeah, we'll we'll we'll, um, we'll work with that. So we, we're both seen as second, we're both teachers in secondary school, and this is really where you see that pipeline of girls and boys really splitting. You know, so and certainly data that that we use sees that you see the boys and girls are fairly even matched in sort of early achievement and interest in maths for quite a long way, basically to the around the end of primary school, and then you see a bit of a, a real drop off, and that seems to be sustained right through to senior secondary. So if I can twist the question a little bit and I'll pose it to both of you because I think it's an important issue in this space. What can we do to better address participation of girls and where does the challenge begin? We can start with, we can start with Greg actually because okay. um, Eddie got to speak first. So. I had, and I might get this statistic slightly wrong because I'm going from memory, but I, I had a journalist phone me the other day and he said, girls outperform boys in 16 of the 19 most, um, most popular um, VCE studies, Victorian journalists, VCEs, A, you talk, girls outperform boys in 16 of the 19 most popular VCE studies. Uh, where they don't out outperform boys is in physics and specialist maths. So what's going wrong with physics and specialist maths? <laughs> and you think, well, that's an interesting framing, isn't it, really? Um, I think there is actually going to be a growing problem, which we're not paying attention to, of male educational underachievement. Um, and at the moment, we don't see it so much because of structural issues, because of the kind of employment that men and women choose to go into, because of um, you know the, the burden of child rearing and all those sorts of factors. But I think over time, we're going to have um, a population of um, very well-educated young women, not so well-educated young men. And I'm not sure that's going to go well for us. But going to the specific point, what, why is it? Um, and I don't really know. I don't, I'm not one of these people that believes there are inherent wiring differences between ma men and women that make them suitable for particular subjects. I think that's... I'm, I'm just not convinced that that's the case. Um, but I do, and I do agree that... Um, that achievement in maths is, is very similar um, amongst both uh, genders up until sort of the end of primary school. So go, going by my previous hypothesis about achievement and motivation, the two things should go together. What I do find interesting, and again, it's a hypothesis and I don't really know, but there was a study that came out recently, which I can't remember the name of, that basically showed that although boys and girls are fairly similar in their achievement in STEM subjects, girls tend to be better in humanities subjects. And the, th the, the idea is that boys see that and start to identify more with STEM subjects. They think, I'm not as good at history as I am at maths. And they build their identity around that a bit. And so they, they sort of positively opt in. And then once you have this subject that's got all these, these boys in it, that can then become quite off-putting for girls who have more options. Because I think, well, I could do maths, I could do history, I could do English literature. And, and they, they've got their options that remain open a little bit more. I don't know how you, I don't know if that's true, if that's the actual thing that's going on. I don't know how you fix that. In 97, when I did my teacher training, one of the things I researched was uh, girls' um, representation in STEM, in, in physics particularly. And at the time, it, there were, there was overt sexism and the way that the subjects were talked about were very um, alienating to girls and, the, and there was a lot of literature on that. Um, so I think it's a mixture of a number of these things, um, but uh, it, it's going to be a thorny one to address. Well, I mean, I, I would, I'd probably add to that. And I, I, I'm familiar with some of the work that you've referred to, Greg, that by and large, as, as you get older through school and into toward post-school, we specialise more, right? We focus more toward the subjects we're best at. And one thing that you see happens is that 
boys tend to be best at subjects like maths and physics and less well do less well in a whole range of other subjects. And this, whereas girls tend to do best in things like English, well, they may still do just as well in maths as as similar boys. But that the pattern you're describing is exactly really what pans out and then becomes self-perpetuating as far as I see. Uh, and my kind of provocation on that is that perhaps in the long run, our best chance of reducing participation gaps when it comes to STEM is to raise boys' literacy. Because if boys' literacy levels were at the same level as girls, they'd be self-selecting in the opposite direction and you'd see those things maybe even out. But uh, I'm conscious that you've also had a lot of time with, with, with students, of course, and, and you've obviously we've talked about the achievement motivation movement with girls and mm -hmm. girls may be losing interest. Not in your class though, Eddie. Well, it's funny you should mention that. Um, First, just let me say, Rory, thank you for your question. I love that you started with so many numbers and made me feel feel really delightful. And then and then you took the you know this beautiful sword and you stabbed me with it because it's a tough situation that we are a tough reality that we're running up against. Um, I need to preface my answer by saying um, I'm not an expert in this area. Um, I'm um, well, I mean, I, I'm 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 not an expert in particularly in girls' education. Certainly not an expert in women. Ask my wife. Um, but what I can speak from is my experience. I'm a father of a daughter and two sons, and I have taught many hundreds of both boys and girls. Uh, this is just a hypothesis, a bit like what Greg was mentioning before, because I don't have hard data underneath this. However, here's what I'll suggest. Uh, like Greg was mentioning, I, I don't subscribe to any kind of, there is an innate ability for, for boys in this area or girls in another. Um, consistently in the highest levels of maths, the equivalent to um, specialist here in New South Wales is mathematics extension two. And when I've had the joy of teaching classes of extension two, uh, almost without exception, I noticed that though they are fewer in number, often my best students are the girls in the class. However, I'd like to point out that while that is objectively true, if you ask them for their opinion, they would not tell you so. And so what I find is that, and again, hypothesis, what I find is that at that sort of 13 to 14 year old um, age where Greg and I get the responsibility of looking after these young men and women, uh, we all know uh, girls develop socially much more rapidly than boys. Uh, in fact, you know, present company might show you that we develop very, very slowly, or well into our 30s and 40s. But what I think I notice is that in a mathematics classroom, taking risks and making errors is critically important. And continually taking risks, intellectual risks, I mean, um, and making errors and saying, okay, what's gone wrong here? Can I, can I work out, uh, can, I, can I dig into why this is wrong and then come to a deeper understanding? This is critically important. Now, if you ask a boy, Okay, tell me what the answer is. They get it wrong. 30 seconds later, they've forgotten the fact that they got it wrong. They look like a bit of an idiot. But as a broad generalization, I'm certainly thinking of my eight-year-old son here, he neither cares nor remembers this fact. Um, my daughter, by contrast, and I've seen many, many girls who exhibit the same uh, phenomenon, are acutely aware of not only what they've gotten wrong, but how it appears to others around them that they've gotten it wrong, what that means about them, whether that's true or not. And I think that that's a huge incentive or disincentive in the classroom to be able to continue to have that mental resilience to just get things wrong over and over again. I, I remember a mathematician in the US describe it, being a successful mathematician is being comfortable with being wrong a lot and persisting. Being that if we can accept that that's a crucial quality for any mathematician to develop, I think there's something in the social fabric there that can't be ignored. That's not to do with mathematical ability, but it deeply affects someone's ability to continue developing that mathematical ability. So there's a hypothesis for you. Uh, just a very very quickly then for you, for you guys, there's a lot of discussion within the policy space about quality teaching and bringing quality teachers into the profession. Is it the quality of teachers coming in or is it the quality of teachers coming out of teacher education that is making that is where we're seeing some of the difficulties here? And just a lightning round from each, Eddie. Yes. <laughs> we're allowed you short asked for lightning we're allowed, round. We're allowed short uh, answers in this one. I would say yes, both. 
uh, which I know is, you know, people hate someone who sits on the fence, but they both are. They both are a huge challenge. And I'd just go back to the comment I made before about the working conditions in schools right now. Uh, many of those schools that I support are really struggling through floods, COVID, the, the kind of pressure that everyday teachers are under at the moment is extraordinary. And we've all seen the signs of that in broader society. I just, it's the elephant in the room and it can't not be mentioned. So I think it's really vital. Greg, teachers coming in, teachers coming out, that's a problem. Uh, look, I, I think there's, a, there's a, been an issue with admitting too many people to teacher education who probably aren't really cut out for it. Um, and we've seen that with the numbers failing the basic literacy and numeracy assessments. But look, if I, if I had a good graduate of biology, for instance, I would rather just take them into the school and teach them how to teach than send them to university because I, I think that would actually harm, that actually does harm. I mean, we even looked into setting up a registered training organisation and trying to train teachers ourselves at our school, but it would just take us, it's so complicated and take us so far away from our core business, we're, we're just not going to do it. But I, I, there's not a lot of value that, that everyone... Everyone I interview, some people now know our school. So they come to our school knowing that, what our agenda is and they'll sort of speak it back to us. But then some graduates who apply who don't know our school and haven't heard of our school, they'll tell us, you know, that in, in, uh, d d the explicit teaching is bad. We should do inquiry learning. It's all about differentiation, you know, d differentiate to all the different... Uh, and it, it, which is really complicated, not much evidence for it. So th they just taught bad ideas, really. So I'd rather... I, I, we do need some mechanism to disrupt that. So we're going to remain in lightning round uh, and a very straightforward question to, to round us out on. Three things that will turn around mathematics achievement in Australia in no particular order. <laughs> Time. Access to research and the expertise that can help translate that research into practice and support for the increasing complexity that schools deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, which I know is similar <laughs> time and related, but they aren't the same thing. And Greg, without copying any of the answers of Eddie. I cheated by going first. Uh, <laughs> look, I don't... You need to do something about initial teacher education, so you, you need to disrupt that. Maybe give schools more um, autonomy to try things out um, because I'm not going to convince everyone in Australia to do it the way I do. I'm certainly not going to convince an education department, So, but I might convince a few schools and if they had the autonomy to experiment that way, then they might be more successful and people might gravitate towards that. I think social media has the potential. Like I've learned a lot through interacting with teachers in the UK, the US directly because we've had these people that sit above us and tell us what to do and have been the sort of gatekeepers for knowledge for so long. Then just talking directly to each other teachers and sharing um, stuff, education, research, that sort of thing has been very powerful. Um, so, yeah, but I also sort of agree with Eddie. Like if you were going to invest lots of money in it, giving teachers more time to, to collaborate would, would also be a really effective use of that. I think ITE, collaboration on social media. Do you have a three? I did. Can't remember what it was. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, please thank. Autonomy to schools. <laughs> please thank uh, Eddie and Greg. For decades, CIS has been a fiercely independent voice working hard to promote sound liberal principles. To be notified of our future videos, make sure you subscribe to our channel, then click the notification bell. We rely solely on the generosity of people like you for donations to advance our classical liberal cause. Check out the links on screen now to see how you can get involved. <laughs>